In Guangzhou's Huadu district, a bustling recruitment hub draws tens of thousands daily seeking employment, rain or shine. This street-side recruitment trend has become a traditional practice in Guangdong province. However, the persistent international industry migration has forced many foreign trade processing factories to shut down or relocate, leaving the remaining struggling without orders, thereby decreasing labor demands compared to previous years. This results in streets crowded with job seekers every day. In Guangzhou's Haizhou district lies Datang Village, the second largest garment labor market, standing alongside Kangle Village and Lujiang Village as the top three garment villages in the city. Every day, these markets are flooded with job aspirants. Footage reveals many factory owners showcasing garment samples, awaiting inquiries from prospective employees who choose work based on the complexity and pricing of the samples. Due to the garment industry's downturn, the number of recruiting employers diminishes while the number of job seekers grow, depressing wages further. Many prefer daily wage settlements, fearing non-payment upon job completion. Some factories demand working 16 hours per day, offering less than 200 yuan or under 30 US dollars, translating to less than 2 US dollars per hour. Guangdong province, hailed as the pioneer of China's economic development, has topped national GDP rankings for 33 consecutive years. Its import and export total value, net fiscal contribution to the central government, population, and population natural growth rate have also remained unparalleled. Courtesy of early reforms and open policies, initial reliance on the Hong Kong port, and subsequent investments from Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Western multinational corporations, establishing China's initial world's factory. Cities like Shenzhen, Dongguan, and Guangzhou became renowned manufacturing hubs, transforming Guangdong into an export-oriented province. Yet, stepping into 2023, data indicates that unlike other provinces which experienced brief recoveries post-pandemic lockdowns, Guangdong's foreign trade has been on a consistent decline, with the slump intensifying. As per Guangdong's Statistics Bureau, from January to June this year, the province's import-export total stood at 3.9 trillion yuan, around 537 billion US dollars, a year-on-year decrease of 1.3%. In exports, processing trade dropped 10.7% in the first half of the year, plunging to 16% in June. Perhaps the dismal July data explains the absence of July's import-export figures on the Bureau's website as of September 17th. However, data from the Huajing Industry Research Institute shows a 7.1% year-on-year dip in the import-export value between January and July 2023, amounting to 753.6 billion US dollars. These figures unveil troubles brewing in Guangdong's foreign trade since the beginning of the year, particularly in the processing trade, the most severely impacted sector. The reality mirrored the current state of cities like Shenzhen, Dongguan, and Guangzhou. A video shows a shutdown factory in Shenzhen, once a workplace for thousands. The visuals of empty workshops strewn with abandoned goods and discarded production equipment paint a bleak picture. Stacks of pallets have hazardly dumped reveal a poignant contrast to the factory's once prosperous days. In another video, a Shenzhen factory owner shares his first-hand experiences, giving a glimpse into the realities of the industry's state on the ground. Man, the factories in Shenzhen this year are in a real dire state. It's incredibly grim out there. At least half of them are either shut down, idle, or have moved out of Shenzhen. The few remaining are struggling to hang on, but who knows for how much longer. Pretty much every month, you hear about factories either not paying wages or shutting down because they've got no orders. A lot of them are moving to other second, third, or fourth tier cities to try and make a go for it. So many companies are in this boat. The latter half of the year in Shenzhen has been just a nightmare. So many factories just can't keep up. It's really the impact of the broader economic environment that's bringing everyone down. Factories in Shenzhen are dwindling, that's the harsh reality. 
You see that building across the street? It's seen countless factories and companies come and go. The company that's moving out downstairs only moved in just over a month ago. It's really tough, you know. Here we are at the Xinqiao Industrial Area in Shenzhen, just having a look around. One of the factories, named Senli Plastic Electronics Co., just closed down this year. The building is empty now, not a thing left, just a hollow workshop. Let's turn our attention to another manufacturing stronghold in Guangdong, Dongguan City, and examine its current state. We've now arrived at the Jingxia Industrial Area in Chang'an Town, Dongguan City. We came to see if any factories are hiring. Right at the entrance of the industrial area, there are tons of signs advertising factory spaces for rent. It's mostly small factories here, hardly any are hiring. After a walk around, it seems factories are either not hiring or renting out their spaces. We're in a small village on the outskirts of Dongguan, the closest one to Shenzhen. It used to be bustling here. It's 6 p.m. now, usually when factory workers are getting off work, but the streets are practically empty. For rent signs are everywhere. This place was booming before, finding a place was almost impossible. Now, I'm inside an industrial park, and I've noticed something. Many factories are renting out their dormitories. Some large factories have even converted their dormitories into apartments for rent. Online, there have been mixed messages. Some say there are fewer people in Dongguan now, while others claim the population has grown. But when you see factories and dormitories up for rent everywhere, it paints a clear picture. Even if the official data shows a population increase, the reality in these industrial parks is stark. Many factories aren't operating at all. So don't just focus on the data, look at the facts. Let the reality speak. This is what the industrial areas look like during off hours now. Just look at the pedestrian flow and the condition of the street side shops. It tells you everything about the current state of Dongguan. In China, there's a saying, Golden September and Silver October, denoting that September and October are traditionally the peak business months across various industries. In previous years, this period also marked the hiring peak season for factories, drawing many workers to Guangdong. However, this year seems to be deviating from the norm. As mentioned at the beginning, the current employment situation in Guangzhou is less than optimistic. Some individuals have taken to broadcasting videos, urging those contemplating migrating to Guangdong for work to reconsider, warning them that job opportunities are sparse. September is usually a bustling season, and I know many people are considering moving to Shenzhen, Guangzhou, or Dongguan in Guangdong province to find work. But listen to me, now is not the time to venture out. From what I've gathered, many of my friends in HR intermediary roles say they've never seen the job market this bad. Wondering what business is most profitable in Shenzhen, Dongguan, and Guangzhou now? You might think factories, but no, it's small hotels and restaurants. Because there are so many people stuck there without jobs and need a place to stay. I'm sure you've seen those online job postings promising daily earnings of two to three hundred yuan. It's all fake. Many people who believe those ads haven't found work. Taking Dongguan as an example, over a thousand manufacturing firms have shut down already. News of factory closures in Dongguan, a new first-tier city, just keeps coming. Even big companies with a 30-year history, like Minghai Dying Industry, and large outdoor furniture manufacturers like Post Group in Dongguan, have gone under. According to some incomplete statistics, between 2022 and 2023, over 3,000 companies in Dongguan have closed, with the manufacturing sector being hit the hardest, accounting for over 1,700 of these closures. Many factories started giving employees extended unpaid holidays from September to cut costs due to the sharp decrease in orders. Can you believe it? Starting annual leave four to five months before the Lunar New Year. It's a looming crisis. Over in Shenzhen, it's the same story. The cost of living was already high, and now many daily wage workers can't find jobs. Some factories have even reduced their hourly rate to as low as 12 or 13 yuan, which is becoming quite common. So if you're considering leaving your hometown to try your luck here, 
you might be better off staying put. Even though the wage might be a bit higher here, the living expenses are also significantly higher. So I suggest you think carefully before making a move. The downturn in the manufacturing sector has resulted in an uptick in unemployment, a phenomenon that reverberates across all layers of society. The most blatant manifestation of this is the dismal state of the consumer market. Once a bustling commercial hub, Guangzhou's Shangxia Jiu Pedestrian Street has succumbed to significant economic downturn. Anyone who's lived in Guangzhou knows about the insane crowds on the Shangxia Jiu Pedestrian Street. We're talking about a whopping 600,000 people passing through on a daily average. Can you picture that? I mean, you couldn't even see the pavement. It's just a sea of heads, one after the other. But now, the contrast is just heartbreaking. Folks, what you're seeing in our frame might not even total a hundred people. As you stroll down Shangxia Jiu, most stores are either shuttered or on their last legs, with just a few scattered ones still open. It just tugs at your heartstrings, doesn't it? This street is the beating heart of business culture in Guangzhou, with a legacy steeped in deep commercial heritage. This is the birthplace of numerous renowned century-old establishments. But now, all we see are widespread closures, including historic brands like Lin Hung Tea House, these once striving shops are barely scraping by, and honestly, I doubt they'll last much longer. Now friends, we're in September, nearly a year after the three-year pandemic period. In theory, the overall economy should be more than halfway back to normal. But looking at the current state of Shangxia Jiu, it seems even worse than during the pandemic. Back then, there weren't this many closed shops. Unexpectedly, post-pandemic, instead of a surge in consumption, we're witnessing an increasing number of closures, which is pretty alarming, if you ask me. Through our lens, you can clearly see that over half the shops on Shangxia Jiu Pedestrian Street are closed. Some might wonder if the owners just haven't opened up yet. At first, I thought so too. But a closer look reveals four transfer signs all over. What do you think, friends? What went wrong that led to this peculiar situation? In fact, post-pandemic reopening did witness a resurgence of foot traffic in many of Guangzhou's commercial areas. Yet, a peculiar trend has emerged. The higher the foot traffic, the more numerous the shuttered stores. This trend underscores a prevailing issue. People are flocking to shopping areas, but their spending has significantly diminished. As we hit the two-thirds mark of 2023, Guangzhou seems to have regained its buzz, bustling with crowds just like old times. Yet, a peculiar trend emerges. Have you noticed? While the city teems with people, strangely, more and more shops are shutting their doors. What does this imply? People are window shopping, but not spending. Don't you agree, friends? We're currently at Tianhe South Road in Guangzhou. You're seeing what I'm pointing out, right? Rows and rows of closed shops. This spells out a stark reality. Consumption is on a decline. Back in the day, there was a saying in Guangzhou, no matter how crappy your product was, if you had the guts to sell it, someone would buy it. But that's not the case anymore. Wherever you go, both in new and old parts of the city, despite the crowds, the shop closures keep multiplying. I wonder if the three-year pandemic reshaped people's spending habits, making even the habitual spendthrifts recognize the importance of saving. In any case, the weirder phenomenon now is, the busier the place, the more shop closures you find. As we mentioned earlier, Guangdong, a region traditionally characterized by its outward-oriented economy predominantly based on foreign trade, is witnessing a rapid decrease in international orders. This comes amidst a visible decline in the manufacturing sector in areas like Shenzhen, Dongguan, and Guangzhou. Since 2019, the escalating trade war between the United States and China has prompted Western corporations to sidestep hefty tariffs by reallocating orders to other countries, resulting in the relocation of many processing and trading factories. This shift has been accelerated over the past three years by the global pandemic and the Chinese government's stringent zero-COVID policy, 
prompting Western companies to recognize the importance of diversifying their supply chains. As a result, Guangdong's foreign trade has been on a noticeable downward trajectory this year, with no signs of recovery thus far. Previously, we reported that Guangdong was the first province to propose the birdcage policy industrial upgrading strategy, intending to abandon simplistic and low-end processing methods. Since 2008, numerous local policies and regulations have been issued to mandate the relocation of representative basic manufacturing industries from various local governments, leading to the widespread relocation of processing trade enterprises and the hollowing out of Guangdong's manufacturing sector. Although the CCP aspires to elevate the overall level of manufacturing in Guangdong through supposed industrial upgrading, the success of this strategy largely depends on the willingness of developed countries to transfer technology to China. At present, the outward-oriented economy of Guangdong is facing severe setbacks. The issue now is not whether the CCP is willing to open up to the world, but rather that the United States and Western markets are no longer fully open to China, shifting key supply chains out of China and pursuing diversified alternatives. With tighter restrictions on high-end technologies, China's industrial upgrading loses substantial support. This makes the birdcage policy strategy, meaning a controlled market economy, and industrial upgrading appear to be wishful thinking on the part of the CCP, serving only to offer false hope to the populace. During a visit to Guangdong from April 10th to 13th this year, Xi Jinping emphasized both the need to expand high-level opening up and to embark on the road of self-reliance, aiming to promote Chinese-style modernization. Xi Jinping stated that critical core technologies should be based on independent research and development, while also welcoming international cooperation. As we know, opening up to the world and Chinese-style modernization represent two fundamentally divergent paths. The former implies China's ongoing integration into the global system fostering cooperation and promoting peaceful and friendly exchanges with Western developed countries to mutually prosper economically. Conversely, Chinese-style modernization essentially signifies self-reliance, synonymous with the so-called internal circulation strategy. In other words, it denotes a path of modernization that China claims to tread alone, without relying on the West, supposedly avoiding being choked in the future. The concept of opening up to the world and Chinese-style modernization are inherently contradictory, yet the party media continues to propagate this rhetoric, likely due to the words coming directly from Xi Jinping, leaving no room for alteration or omission in the reporting. This has probably left Guangdong officials perplexed, uncertain about how to implement such directives. Xi Jinping stated, we will never close the door to the world on our own. We are willing to work together with any country that seeks win-win cooperation with us. However, as the U.S. and other Western nations close their doors to China, the CCP is struggling to retain foreign investments. Forced to fervently advocate for self-reliance, Guangdong finds itself losing international market, with domestic markets nowhere to be found. Thus, the calls for self-reliance or Chinese-style modernization remain nothing more than empty rhetoric. And this kind of international market, once lost, would not be so easy to regain. The lady below pointed out that China mainly plays the role of producing and processing in the global supply chain, not providing products with Chinese branding. After the disappearance of orders from the West, the closure of Chinese factories is inevitable, and it's also irreversible. Let me break it down for you experts with some basic facts about foreign trade. This current dip in foreign trade orders, it's the effect of the CPTP mechanism at play. If we can't flip this scenario quickly in five years, China's foreign trade is going to be pretty insignificant on the world stage. First things first, what the experts don't get is the goods China exports to the U.S. They ain't Chinese branding products, you know. Majority are just made in China, but they're actually branded as American products. 
We're talking about stuff like Apple phones, Dell computers, Pantene shampoo, Lego toys, Nike and Adidas sportswear, branded shirts, and the like. So basically, what the U.S. needs is China's manufacturing prowess, not the Chinese products. Why is that? Simple in the day-to-day, -day, Americans don't really rely on Chinese products that much. Just look at the essentials like clothing and food. The brands are mostly Western. Back in the day, most of the orders for the top 10 branded shirts were placed with Chinese factories, but it was all in the form of made in China. Food-wise, the top three grain merchants are all in the U.S. Housing, they've got plenty of single homes built with abundant North American wood, and they don't need to import cement and steel from China. Transportation, they've got General Motors, Ford, Tesla, Boeing. For electronics and appliances, they are mainly Japanese and Korean brands. What can they use from China? Maybe some pots, dishes, and small commodities, but it's practically negligible in daily life. Get it now! They need our affordable labor for basic manufacturing, not the so-called supply chain that you're talking about. Your supply chain will quickly quiet down once the orders vanish. Next up, what the experts aren't grasping is that the main consumer markets in the world are the U.S., Europe, Japan, and Korea. Without their orders, the orders from China's old friends can't keep our factories running at full capacity. If factories can't operate at full tilt, losses will occur. Once losses stack up to a certain level, factories will close down. And reopening them? Oh, that's going to be a tough one. It's straightforward, really. No funds and disappearing management teams. Moreover, these experts don't get that the West decoupling from China is a reactive move. It's all about securing the industrial chain, essentially not relying too much on Chinese imports and spreading their eggs into different baskets. And this means as some production shifts out of China, the related industrial chain will move too, causing a decline in China's exports. And it's not about deliberately suppressing China with tech restrictions, but addressing China's previous forced tech transfers and shortcuts. Especially ensuring these products and technologies aren't used for military purposes. Lastly, what experts don't understand is, whether it's old friends or little buddies, they can't provide a reliable market because their markets are narrow, consumption rates low, and frankly, they're unreliable. It's nonsense to think that future reliance on car manufacturing, new energy electronics, and biopharmaceutical industries can sustain exports. The so-called new forces in car manufacturing will vanish, no doubt. My reasoning is twofold. Such huge capacity will surely trigger a massive internal cutthroat competition, causing many car companies to fold in a price war. Second, given the U.S. chip ban, most car companies won't innovate, producing low-end products and getting phased out by the market. The same goes for other industries. Forget the CPTP mechanism causing cost issues for a moment. Just the origin and chip issues alone could kick you out of the competition. As foreign capital pulls out, Taking away funds and the industrial chain, private enterprises will close down, bosses will flee with the savings and management experiences, leaving only those furious, fist-waving, patriotic youths blaming the U.S. for everything. Huh?